Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, leadership dialogue on food loss and waste prevention and reduction, a key lever for agri-food systems transformation. My name is Divine Njie. I am the Deputy Director of FAO's uh, Division on Food Systems and Food Safety. So I will be moderating the event. So we have a very, very uh, interesting program, but we also have uh, very limited time. So without further ado, I will call on Mr. Maximo Torero, Chief Economist of FAO, to make the introductory uh, presentation and technical background. Over to you. Mr. Thank you. Torero. Thank you very much, Divine. If we can put the PowerPoint, please. Okay. Thank you so much. So the only the, the reason why we want to do this small technical presentation is to set up the scene and to update where we are today in terms of food loss and waste and what we need to do to, to move forward in this agri-food system transformation. So the first thing is normative, and which is very important so that we all speak the same language. When we refer to food losses, we are referring from the producer up to the, re the wholesale included. And when we refer to waste, we refer from the retail to the consumer so that everybody understands uh, what we are talking about and we don't confuse the concept of what is losses and what is waste, which normally happens. And it's very important to differentiate it because the policies are different and the actions are different and the situation of the countries are different. The second point is on the number. In terms of food losses and presented as a percentage uh, of the global production, we are today, and this is the latest number we have, on 13.2% of losses. But the variance across regions is very different and of course across commodities. 20% in Sub-Saharan Africa is the biggest, is the highest number in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa. And then we have the variance of the other regions. So it's really important also uh, to keep tracking this number and what we are trying to do is trying to, to have a system in place that will allow us to keep updating the number. In the case of food waste, we're talking of 17% and that's reported by UNEP, not, not by FAO. But we need to be careful. We cannot add up the 13.2 to the 17 because different methodologies, they have some overlaps, which are small, but there are some overlaps. So let's be careful to look at losses number and the waste number until we can come up with a common framework that will allow us to add them up. But at this point, it's 13.2 of losses and 17% uh, of waste. Now, if we took this 13.2 of losses, we are talking of 931 million metric tons of food, all food aggregated, 120 kilograms per capita lost in 2019. And as you can see, this is very inconsistent to the reality we're living today. Now, let's be very clear. Nobody is saying that losses should go to zero. That's impossible. It's all even inefficiency to go to zero. We will have some losses. But what we are saying is that the numbers are too high. And in some high-value commodities, it go up more than 30 percent. And that's the big problem that we need to, to figure out and to resolve how to resolve in the case of, of losses. Now, work that we have been doing with, with IFPRI and, and uh, Delgado, uh, the et al. and other collaborators, is to try to understand where the losses occur. If they are at the pre-harvest, at the post-harvest, at the processor, or at the middle level. Normally, we have focus enormously on the post-harvest side. What we are finding in this more detailed technology methodology to measure, and here we are putting four different ways, three different ways of measuring, is essentially that most of the losses are happening at the farmer level. And most of it is even before harvest. So we need to look at that because that changed completely where we have to look at the hot spots. So the green represents the farmer, the middleman represents the blue, and the red is the processor. Middlemen have very little losses because they normally will pick the produce that is the best quality to avoid them having the losses. And then the processor is taking technical losses. But on the farmer, that's the biggest level. And we, we look within the farmer. All the pre-harvest up to the point of the harvest have the significant proportion of it. And then comes the post-harvest, which is also high. But it's important also to look at across the whole value chain and not only to look at the post-harvest side. Now, this reality in a context where we have 783 million, up to 733 million people facing chronic undernourishment, a number that is projected to be 600 by 2030, 2.4 billion people that don't have access to the quality of food they need, and significant problems in state of nutrition targets. 148.1 million children under five years of age, 
were stunted, 45 million were wasted, 37 million were overweight, and so on and so forth. So that's the big challenge here. These two things don't make any sense. We lose food and people are undernourished completely or overnourished completely. So we need to fix the solution and that's what we are trying to do in this call. Why is so important? Because just in a simple exercise of simulating 50% of reduction of food loss and waste, in this case I am aggregating waste, it means that we will have sufficient fruits and vegetables available in the food supply to cover the recommendations globally. Again, this is a simulation, an extreme situation, but look at the potential returns that this could have. Now, there is a lot of specific things within that that we need to look at in terms of policies and so on, but I think it's very telling the options that we have and the opportunities we have in reducing food loss and waste. At the same time, significant share of the emissions, 8 to 8 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions, are because of how we destroy the food that we don't consume. And part of it is because how we produce it. But if we waste or lose that food, then we lose also that investment in emissions. And of course, in natural resources. So again, it's not only not providing the amount of food and the quality that people could have to improve their diets, but it's also damaging the environment and misuse of natural resources. In the transformation pathways that were presented in the summit, 70% of them mention the importance of loss and waste. So this is something that the countries already know and they want to put as part of the transformation pathways. And they have put several priorities in the transformation pathways that go from awareness to how to find solutions and resolve the problems that we are facing in loss and waste. So are completely present in the transformation pathways and that's why this session is so important that we can follow. Now, what are the guiding questions that we have for the panelists today? First, what are the challenges faced and the progress made since the Food Systems Summit in prevention and reduction of food loss and waste? So how much of that 70% of the pathways are trying to implement something? And this applies not only to developing countries, north and south. The numbers are big across the world. On one side, bigger in losses, on the other side, bigger in waste. Second, how has food loss and waste prevention and reduction resulted from a contributed to a more efficient, resilient and inclusive agri-food system? How can trade-offs be minimized in achieving sustainability in all dimensions? The creation of emissions and the waste of emissions is a trade-off in the way we destroy the food that we don't eat. How can the means of implementation of food loss and waste prevention and reduction such as finance, science and technology be mobilized or leveraged at the scale at subnational, national and global levels? So those are the core questions. But colleagues, why science is so important? Because we know now that it's not just storage facilities, it's not just silos. It's not just post-harvest technologies. It's a lot more that we have to improve across the value chain to reduce losses. And also, of course, a lot of behavioral change that we have to do to reduce waste as well as regulation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Torero, for laying uh, the background. I think it was very clear from your presentation the uh, important role that the prevention and the reduction of food loss and waste can play in transforming agri-food systems with a view to achieving the uh, SDGs in the Agenda 2030. So we have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Excellencies, an exciting panel here to go into these issues. Mr. Torero has laid the background, but let, let's look at some concrete examples and what are the success factors that uh, have led to achievements in this area with a view of looking at specific countries, but also in some cases, regional approaches. So we have a very, very mixed panel, but very, very experienced panel. And I will introduce each member of the panel as I call them to make their remarks. And the, th to kick things off, we will have His Excellency Anchos Masuka, who is the Minister of Lands, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water and Rural Development of Zimbabwe. Your Excellency, can you provide us the context of food loss and waste in Zimbabwe? What has been done to address it? the challenges faced and the success factors in uh, achieving some of the goals that you set for yourself. You have, I am sorry, I have to be very strict, you have a maximum of four minutes, Your Excellency. Well, thank you very much, uh, Moderator, Deputy Director, and thank you to the Chief Economist for those introductory remarks, um, contextual in the world sense, 
but more specifically to my country, Zimbabwe. We've recently completed a study of some of the major value chains, maize uh, loss at uh, 16%, down to uh, tomatoes, 9%. Average loss is about 11.3%, and we define loss and waste separately. And in that sequential order, as uh, the chief economist has indicated, we've isolated uh, three er five, five or so areas where loss can happen at av during harvesting, especially in the smallholder sector, uh, drying, transport, processing, storage, and also then the waste aspect, which we really have not given uh, sufficient attention to and which we ought to. So in terms of statistics, we are doing slightly better than the sub-Saharan Af sub African average that is, um, the chief economist has uh, indicated, but maize is the staple food in Zimbabwe, and we require 2.2 million metric tons annually. We lose 16 percent. That is two months supply for the whole nation. If we are able to reduce that by just 50 percent, it means we'll be able to do much more and uh, with the attendant benefits from uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. But what have we done? We've launched a major awareness campaign with 35,000 villages in the country. We now have established 35,000 farmer field schools, one in each village, to be able to raise awareness. And this is an inclusive cocktail of measures that we undertake. At a national level, we have now expanded our silo capacity from 750,000 metric tons of metal silos to 1.2 million metric tons. We are also accelerating harvesting. We have recently increased our combine harvester capacity by about 41%. And this uh, at also complemented by an increase in tractor fleet, believe it or not, for a country as small as Zimbabwe, we have recently purchased 7,000 tractor units. And this is increasing our mechanization capacity by 30%. At the village level, from now onwards, we are now going to give each of the 3 million uh, Households in communal Zimbabwe give each a grain protectant under the, uh, the government scheme to be able to secure this harvest. We are going further. From 2023 summer, which is November this year, we are going to be issuing now a silo per village so we can establish a strategic grain reserve for each of these villages. These interventions uh, are, are costly but necessary. We have looked at the cost-benefit analysis, and we believe that intervening in this way will assist us in assuring the nation of resilient, sustainable food security. And we are beginning to see the impact of this. So thank you, moderator. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency Masuka. I think that those are some very, very good uh, uh, interventions. I, I got from your uh, introductory remarks the importance of identifying the critical loss points where these uh, losses are taking place. And then also a key intervention that you are embarking upon is to raise awareness. And just to get you prepared for the next stage, we would like to know uh, given all these that you've done, how do you see them fitting into the transformation or improvement of food systems? That will be for the next round. And now we have the opportunity to, to pass on to our next uh, distinguished panelist, and we're going to have the opportunity here to have a regional view. We've heard from a national perspective, but let's see from a regional point of view what can also be, be done and what is actually being done. Dr. Rola Dashte is the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. So, Dr. Dashte, I thank you for your presence here, and I want to ask you, you have uh, a regional organization, and can you talk about what is being done and what has been achieved? And you are coming from a region that has some uh, a very, very important environmental issues, if you can reflect upon those and how these are linked to the issue of food loss and waste, it will be appreciated. You have about four minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Divine. Uh, let me build on uh, what uh, Tor Maximo and uh, the minister from Zimbabwe spoke about. I just want to put contextualization of the food and loss in the Arab region. 
if we eliminate food and loss in our Arab region, we can wipe out the external debt of Jordan, Tunisia, Djibouti, Mauritania, Somalia, and Yemen. We lose almost $60 billion. So the, the magnitude is so important that this issue has to be at the forefront. Now, the other, in the addition, which uh, Maximo has uh, alluded to, is the natural resources waste associated with the food uh, loss, which is water. We live in a very scarce water resource region. And wasting agriculture products is wasting water, which is extremely important for stability and livelihood. Because to us, water could be a source of conflict, a future conflict, if it's not managed. Because most of our water is a transboundary water. So that issue is extremely important in that context. Now, what we are doing is we're highlighting this issue to policymakers, not only to ministers of agriculture, because the governance structure is absent. It's countries are working in silos instead of having a task force that is integrated, there's a better governance structure that, because what we're talking about is not uh, only the production of the agricultural product, but it's trade also with it, it's the consumption of, it's a whole cycle that needs to be governed properly and, and m moving forward. So we need, need to bring various stakeholders to the issue and it's not confined, the issue of production and uh, loss and waste is with the Ministry of Agriculture in that. So we are trying to help and support member states in bringing the governance structure properly so that policies could be addressed uh, more effectively as, as we move along. We have done a study on Morocco on the production on wheat and dates. We found out at the production level for storage in wheat, farmers lose just because of storage almost 20% of their production. On dates, at the harvest stage and during harvest, uh, farmers lose almost 30% of their production. So there is a lot of efficiency that needs to be done and a lot of support and banking on technological advancement also to address this issue, especially when we're talking about wheat and it's important stable material uh, for, for the country. So we are also helping, not only identifying, because data is extremely important. Data is absent. We need to invest in collecting data so that we can move and do a better policy arrangements as, as we move along. We're doing capacity building on member states to advance their knowledge and understanding uh, of it. And we are doing also on the waste side, awareness. And the awareness we're doing also through education because we're going into the school system and using interactive methods, okay, and uh, informing students at, at the early age about the importance of the, the agriculture and the, the importance of to minimize the waste as we go along. But as uh, also Maximo just mentioned also, we will not eliminate 100% our losses and waste. So what we are doing is also improving and, and uh, advocating for circular economy, utilizing the waste to be used also in the agricultural process as we move along. So this is also a process that we are moving and working with member countries to, to move into the circular economy. In addition, we are working with the League of Arab States in, in terms of promoting and the uh, issuance of uh, regulation among the Arab states on the food and loss, uh, food and, uh, and loss on agricultural products, as well as we started looking and speaking to the parliamentarians because there's a lot of legislation that is, needs to be done at the country level on, on, on parliamentarians. So we're bringing also the parliamentarians and we're planning to bring parliamentarians so that to advocate on also issuing a declaration so as a template of rules and regulations that needs to be adopted within the country as, as we move uh, along on, on that uh, uh, issue. Success is mapping and monitoring as, as we go along and we're building on partnership. Uh, we have di disseminated the best practices and guidelines on, on food and loss, building on the work that uh, our sister coordination, uh, Europe ECE, 
uh, Europe Economic Commission and FAO on, on that guidelines so that we promote better guidelines so that we take them. We're reaching out to the farmer, but we're reaching out also to the policymaker, as well as we're reaching out to the consumer as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dashti. You've, you've <laughs> definitely, uh, you've uh, highlighted some very, very important uh, aspects here. The economic uh, uh, footprint that food losses and waste has, the, uh, the importance of, of data, capacity building, and very, very importantly, also the governance dimension. And now, uh, building upon your intervention, we still, I am still going to stay on my left-hand side and still also still uh, look at things from a regional perspective. And um, we, we're going to invite Ms. Claire Bory, who is the Deputy Director General of the Directorate General for Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. Deputy Director General Bory, as you are responsible for the quote unquote food sustainability excuse me, food sustainability dimension of the, uh, of the EU's work, and also in your capacity as the EU food systems convener, could you just explain to us some of the actions that the, uh, the, the EU has recently taken with respect to this uh, very problematic area of food loss and waste? Over to you. Thank you very much, Devine, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, thank you very much to Maximo for his update and for really uh, structuring and, and putting the, the figures out there for us. So I'd like to do three things, uh, Divine, if I may. First of all, uh, as you've requested, say what we're doing. Uh, secondly, talk about what we think the benefits of that are. And here, I think I will chime quite a lot with what Rolla has just said. Um, but then also say how we think we're going to get uh, to our objectives. So be very practical about it. Um, and taking Maximo at his word, I'm going to say that I'm going to focus on food waste rather than uh, food loss. Uh, so not at the primary production stage, but later uh, in the chain. So as you've already, I think, outlined very well, Maximo and, and Rollo has confirmed it, um, that this is one of the largest sources of insufficiency in our agri-food chain. Uh, we have already commitments, I think, to the SDG goal 12.3, but what we see in the EU is that at the moment we are really not making progress uh, in terms of meeting that target. Um, so we have been working over some years now, but, and, and I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to have something uh, to talk to you about today, which is that <clears throat> at the beginning of July, uh, the Commission has proposed to the Member States that they should set targets now, legally binding targets, uh, for trying to reduce, in particular, uh, the food waste. Um, we are proposing to do this in a stepwise approach. We realize that because we're quite a long way from the targets that have been set at the uh, UN level, we need to be, take a bit of time on it. We need to bring everybody uh, along. Uh, but we are suggesting that the member states should reduce food waste at national level uh, by 2030, uh, by 30% in retail, restaurants, food services and households, and by 10% in processing and manufacturing. So we're focusing on what for us um, is basically the hotspot, uh, which is consumer waste. Um, we have not at all lost sight of the 50% target. This is uh, an interim target that we've set, and in 2027, we'll review the situation and then hopefully be able to um, increase uh, and meet the UN target. So secondly, what, what are the benefits that we see from this? I think you talk very uh, clearly in terms of saving money for countries, in terms of debt and, and water and so on. And in the calculations that we've made, we see very clearly that there are gains for the environment, um, around 60 million tonnes of reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions, um, average savings of around 400 uh, euros per year for a four-person household, which in the cost of living crisis that we have at the moment is, is not insignificant, and an overall value added for the EU economy of 1.6 billion. So this is what our economists are telling us we can do if we can uh, meet these targets. And obviously, when there are times of high food inflation, I think you were emphasizing that too, we can't really, I think for moral reasons, we shouldn't be allowing this kind of waste to, to take place. So how will we get there? I think this is obviously the big question. Um, and we've been working on this since 2015. We already have an action plan at EU level. Uh, there are two things um, that we've done. One is, first of all, to set out a measurement, a very clear measurement 
Um, as, as you, I think Massimo and, and Rolla said the same thing, you know, having the right data at our disposal. So the member states have gathered the data for the last year. Um, it's not a huge amount of data, but it's been enough, I think, for us to project uh, these targets. And the second thing is that we work with member states to establish their own national food waste uh, prevention programs and to reduce and monitor what they're doing. And our support takes three forms. One is sharing best practice and resources and learning. Uh, we have platforms, we have digital platforms where the information is shared. Um, secondly, for the consumer end of things, again, as I say, it needs to be very much, each country needs to tailor uh, to their own particular consumers in terms of their habits and so on. Uh, but we have produced, with the assistance of the European Parliament, a compendium with tools, solutions and recommendations which all the member states can uh, tap into. And last, uh, but not least, of course, uh, research and innovation. Um, what are the sources? I think this is also going back to what you were saying, Massimo, no? which is, uh, you know, we thought maybe it was just about uh, post-harvest loss, but we really have to investigate what's going on. We have to identify in a scientific way where the problems are. Um, and we're also giving particular uh, specific grants for member states in terms of, of gathering data. So our member states are the ones, as I say, who are well placed uh, to develop uh, their programs, to look at how their consumers uh, react. We are trying to trigger, and if anybody's been in, into the atrium um, and looked down there, we are also getting people to try and think about what food means, what it is, what's on their plates, uh, what's in their fridges, what's going on. I think it's by stimulating consumers to think about it as well and then giving them the tools that we can help make a difference. Uh, for us, the global aspect of this is key. Uh, we want to interact uh, with our uh, partners and we want to share the expertise and of course we know that we can learn from you as well. I'm already hearing things that we will take away uh, and take back with us uh, but we are really stand ready to pursue this collaboration uh, because this challenge as I think you said Massimo at the beginning is one that we we really have to meet now now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much Deputy Director Claire Bury. We've, uh, we've really gotten some insights into how the situation is at the uh, European uh, Union level, and uh, you've highlighted some very, very important uh, in interventions that are critical to making a dent on this issue. One thing that struck me in what you said is that the, the work of, the, of uh, your uh, commission is helping to set a framework, but that you are allowing countries to adapt their specific interventions to their particular context. I think uh, that's uh, a very, very important and uh, a very, very interesting uh, approach. And you also highlighted the importance of uh, research and development, setting targets, and also um, the, uh, the, I believe also you mentioned the awareness raising uh, dimension. Now, building upon all of this, looking at some of the, uh, the points that have been made with the re regional interventions in terms of how they, uh, they speak to the interventions that are carried out at country level, we're going to look at another country case, and in this uh, instance, the United States of America. And I am going to uh, call on uh, on the Secretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Ms. Jennifer Moffitt. Uh, Ms. Moffitt, now the U.S. is very, very active in this area of food loss and waste. Could you kindly explain to us in more detail what the actions are and what the benefits are, considering that the context is also the SDGs that we are trying to achieve? If you could do that in four minutes, I know that's very challenging. <laughs> we will be very grateful. Thank you. Over to you. Yes, absolutely. And um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. We know that in order to achieve a more sustainable, more sustainable food systems overall, we must address food loss and waste. In the United States, over a third of our food is lost or wasted. Over a third of our food is lost and wasted. <coughs> That, of course, impacts food security. That, of course, impacts farmer livelihoods. That, of course, impacts our rural economies in the United States. So the United States has a goal of reducing food loss and waste by 50% by 2030. 
50 percent by 2030. This goal was established in 2015. And I'll get to our actions and I'll quickly summarize them. But what I first want to say is in order to really achieve that goal, important, of course, is to set that target, but also is to measure against our progress. Measuring is important. It takes all of government to do it. So um, we have convened a team across all of U.S. government so that we are measuring that progress, um, whether that is at the federal side or also all the way down to municipal. Um, it is very important that we set a baseline and measure against that progress so that we know where we are and we know where we need to work, continue to work to do harder, um, and we know where we are. Um, but then that I'll just jump into ACT because, yes, setting targets is important, measuring progress is important, actions are very important to make sure that we hit those targets. Uh, so we have a few actions that I'll summarize. We have many actions. I'll just summarize a few of them. Uh, one is that we've partnered with the private sector and we've created a 2030 Champions Challenge. Uh, and so we have many different industry sectors who have adopted and come on board with this Champion Challenge. These are businesses, these are uh, food organizations, they're retailers, they're processors, they're producers. Um, and they have taken on this challenge to reduce their food loss and waste by 50% by 2030 as well. Um, and so this is an important part of bringing on the private sector into the work that we're doing. So they have different ways that they're working to achieve their goals. Some are redirecting food that is about to spoil but it's still very good to food banks and to feeding organizations is just one example. Uh, we're also, as government, innovating with industry. Industry is um, incredible at innovating, thinking about how do we take a uh, product that is perhaps ugly produce, um, produce that people don't want to consume or purchase at the retail sector, but it's still great quality produce. They might be strawberries that are just as healthy, just as good, just as nutritious, and just as safe for consumers to eat. And that's safety is very important as well. And turning those into nutritious fruit bars that students can take to school um, to get that great food. So upcycling, looking at innovative product development through food is also very important. And then also our partnership um, across U.S. government and with our municipalities on organics recycling, turning food that is no longer edible into compost that can then go and to grow more food. So those are a couple things that we're doing in, within our government and within um, the domestic side of the house. We also, through USAID, are doing a lot of partnership with many of our partner countries as well. Uh, the funding that we have to keep food fresh longer. We've heard some of the examples already. The Food Loss Pay and Waste Partnership Facility grants that USAID has in Tanzania and Kenya, I think are really good examples of how we're supporting and enhancing more cold and dry chains so that food stays safe and free from pests or other food safety um, problems longer. Uh, also, we're working with on pre-harvest food loss as well. That is a very important component. We've heard that, of course, from Maximo in his presentation about the pre-harvest loss. So USAID is working with many of our member countries on addressing uh, pre-harvest food loss, as well as the work that we're doing at USDA with IPPC and through the FAO uh, in partnering on things like how do we address pest management issues to reduce food uh, loss. Finally, packaging innovation and the work that USAID is doing uh, on packaging innovation. Things, for example, like uh, innovating bags of rice so that those rice are no longer infestated with pests. And I'll just wrap by saying um, this innovation is really important. We are taking many, many actions. It all starts with setting targets, measuring progress, and then, of course, always taking actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Under Secretary Moffitt. I think you made some very, very important points highlighting yet again the importance of setting targets and measuring yeah. progress. It was, I think, also the point here that was made that, okay, you have government setting all these frameworks and policies, but who is going to take action is the actors in the value chain. And I think that's a very important point that I think speaks to most of the uh, experiences that many countries are finding. So I thank you very much for your intervention. Now we, we have the opportunity, so we've heard from the kind of the public sector side in a way, 
we have the opportunity, we have the privilege of having somebody, an expert, from the World Bank. And Ms. Gita Sethi is the, uh, is the food systems, is the global lead for food systems with the World Bank, an economist with a great deal of experience in this area. And so, Gita, you've heard all these uh, interventions that are being carried out. What do you think are the success factors? And if you could uh, explain a little bit from more from the means of implementation, financing, which is a critical issue, and also uh, drawing from your economic background, how you balance the trade-offs that might occur when you do interventions. Over to you, and if you could do it, all of that in three to four minutes, that will be appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. I do miracles. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, really, thank you to Maximo. He has been a great champion. And thank you for this invitation and for an amazing panel. Um, let me start with something that really fascinated us when we started this journey, and very quickly. You know, why doesn't Sony throw out one TV of every three they make? So what is so unique about the food sector that we can get, we are very comfortable losing or wasting 30% or one third of produce. And it all comes down to way the food's priced. Uh, we heard that really food, system, uh, food loss and waste is a s symptom of a broken food system. A food system is broken because food's not priced right because we've not internalized externalities. In other words, the environmental costs, the health costs, exact, uh, social costs. But to get food price right is, ups, is, is, is unviable in the world we are in, right? So this is sort of the first part I wanted to put out. The second is, and, and the speakers referred to this, is the implications on the global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and Maximo's slide also carried that. So clearly, subsidizing investments in food loss and waste or providing concessional or grant financing is very valid because there's a very strong global public good agenda that gets dealt with if we are addressing losses and waste. With that, um, with all of that, um, I think what we've heard here has been a very, very strong political commitment, a very strong uh, um, diagnostic to really understand uh, for each geographies, and it's been unique, and this is a very important that the, Yes, we talk global numbers, but the interventions are at the national level, which means one needs to really understand commodity-specific, geographic-specific, spe uh, uh, what is happening to the losses and waste, sort of the hotspots, no? And that's exactly what we heard. So that's sort of the second big reason why things have worked well. The third is awareness, and, uh, and, 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 and this becoming a very important part of the conversation about fixing the planet and, and creating healthy people. Fourth is that it has br brought in private sector. So we've looked at both. So, the, so the, the, what I heard from the, from, from, from the countries is that, 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 that th this, this needs partnerships of people, of governments, of, uh, of philanthropists, development finance, and, and private finance, um, because it, it needs innovation, it needs technology to increase um, it needs infrastructure, improved infrastructure, uh, to be able to increase the shelf lives. Be it's also true that addressing losses and waste has a very important health, um, healthy diet story. It's the more perishable that are prone to higher losses, and, and, and therefore creating longer shelf lives, which is where a lot of new technology and startups and a company from California, Peel, comes to mind. Uh, that, that by uh, uh, putting uh, some kind of a um, glue, a kind of a glue, natural glue, they have been able to increase the shelf life of fruits and vegetables. But you also wanted me to spend time in terms of the means of implementation. So, the, uh, and, and what, what is important and why, it's success, what, why countries are doing so well, are, are moving in this agenda and addressing it. Um, Diagnostics, they have to be done country specific, commodity specific. They have to be done with the idea of what are the big development goals a country has. In our work, we've now done about 25 countries and we've looked at food loss and waste in terms of the global greenhouse gas emissions for that country, trade balances for that country, environmental stress, 
farmers' income and farmers' welfare. With that, then it's very easy to intervene to see what happens to those big policy um, uh, goals. The second is, with these diagnostics, the public and the private need to be brought around at the same round table to really uh, explain that the, the, if the government does get the regulatory frameworks right, what will the private sector do? And what else does it need in terms of mitigation? Um, and if, and if really a strong de-risking aspect that, that comes through only with, with good information, good data, which was already mentioned. I did this in four and something, over to you. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sethi. I think uh, if we had, there, there, is so much, there is so much in what you said that I wish we had additional time. But you did mention the importance of means of implementation, diagnostics, and, and so on. And, also uh, underscored yet again the important role that uh, the private sector has to play in this uh, endeavor and for the uh, public sector to provide the necessary conditions. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, so we've heard our uh, first primary panel. Uh, we are a little bit pressed for time and if you, if you agree with me, we're going to have to close at the the time that was set for this, which is in the next uh, 15 minutes. But we still, uh, it's, it's got to be a dialogue. This wasn't meant to be a push down uh, event, it's got to be a dialogue. And so I want to give the, the opportunity to uh, uh, the floor, the audience to, to react. You've, you've heard some of the experiences here. Does it echo with what you're doing? Are there any lessons that you can pick up and to kick things up, I will, I will start right from the front row here. We have some uh, countries that had requested the floor, but we're definitely going to come to you. Now, uh, for our three distinguished uh, 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 second session panelists here, I want to give you, I, I wish I could have more time, but I'm going to have to restrict to two minutes. And uh, if you could just, you know, reflecting upon what you've had, kind of link this to your own country and your own experiences. And first off, I will call His Excellency Stephen Victor, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and the Environment of Palau in the Pacific. You have the floor, two minutes, please. Thank you, Divine, and good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share Palau experience on food loss and, and waste. In our 2021 uh, Food Systems Dialogue, our stakeholders identified food waste from school meal programs, uh, restaurants, and customary events. We've also identified uh, food loss stemming from invasive species, such as wild pigs, rats, uh, that primarily affects uh, root crops, and fruit flies impacting an already limited supply of uh, locally produced foods. We are also seeing noticeable contribution of climate change to food loss in Palau. Taro fields that are inundated during silver rise and king tides that have become more frequent has led to loss of nutritious taro. Uh, we've taken a whole of government and society approach to address food waste and, and food loss within our uh, food system pathways. Working with our cultural organizations, private sector and our Ministry of Human Resources, Culture and Tourism, we are tackling food waste from uh, customary events and restaurants. Our primary strategy is raising awareness of the contribution of food to healthy living and healthy lifestyles that can help reduce non-communicable disease and reduce food waste. We believe reducing food waste is a climate action. <clears throat> Within our tourism sector, we've developed a carbon calculator that can help visitors and business understand their carbon footprint and so they can make appropriate decisions as to what activities to participate as well as to buy food source from and local producers that implement practices to reduce food loss. Our Ministry of Health and Human Services, Ministry of Education and our bilateral partners from Japan and Taiwan have implemented a nutritional program in our public school breakfast and lunch program to introduce more healthy food and grow healthy eating habits. We are seeing a decline in food waste. Reducing food loss and waste is an issue 
that cannot be toggled by only a few. It requires all of us to act. I thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you for staying within the time. And I think you uh, mentioned very importantly a whole of government approach and your example of actually also bringing in the tourism sector, I think is an eloquent example. We're going to pass now to, uh, the, uh, to, to hear the situation in Turkey and we will listen to uh, His Excellency Fuat Kasim Khan, who is the national convener and the general director for the EU and interministerial affairs in the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. Over Th to you. Thank you. Thank and you. Two minutes, please. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, due to the magnitude and complexity of the problem, a uh, holistic multidisciplinary response is required to address it, involving all actors and stakeholders affected by food laws and waste. Being aware of this, in 2020, uh, we, as the Minister of the Agriculture and Forestry of Turkey, in cooperation with FAO, launched a national campaign entitled Save Your Food. This pioneering campaign aims to raise awareness of the food loss and uh, best and combat with the problem at the both national and international level. As part of the campaign, a national strategy on prevention, reduction and monitoring of food loss and waste and accompanying action plan were prepared. The campaign has been so rewarding that the Guinness World Record on post most pledges received for a campaign was broken uh, with 881,000 8, pledges to the online Save Your Food campaign. Besides, household saving on West duty campaign reached around 80 million US dollars. We also managed to raise the awareness of data labeling by 20% and decrease our cooking and our portioning by 40%. Finally, 93% uh, of consumers found the campaign useful and 84% were more alert to food waste. Furthermore, with uh, Turkey's financial support, FAO has implemented a regional project on food loss and waste under the FAO Turkey partnership programs. The recently concluded project Reducing food loss and waste in Central Asia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey gave us the opportunity to contribute to global efforts to achieve key elements of the 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals, in particular SDG 12. We are proud of to part of the Save Food Campaign and Regional Food Loss and Waste Project. We are optimistic that the achievements of the campaign and project will result in giant, step, giant steps for transformation agri-food system. Let us keep working together more efficiently to reduce loss, low food loss and waste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for once again, staying within the time. Thank you very much. And we're going to go last but not least on our second panel. Uh, we will call on uh, His Excellency Arief Presetio Adi of uh, Indonesia. He is also in charge of, is the chief of the uh, National Food Agency. Over to you, Your Excellency, in two minutes, please. Chairperson, Mr. Moderator, it will be very fast. Allow me to thank for giving me the opportunity to share food loss and waste in the agri-food systems. This agenda is very relevant with Indonesia effort on transforming food system in the country, which not only focus on socio-economic sector, but also to ensure environmental sustainability. Indonesia is the archipelago country, more than 313,700 islands with 270 million people. It is crucial to prevent and reduce food loss and waste. 14% of our global food production has been lost and 17% has been wasted due to our lifestyles and behaviors. Food loss and waste has negative impacts on food security and nutrition. Indonesia food loss and waste between 2000 and 2019 has reached 48 million metric ton, which around 36.6 uh, billion US, 
or 5% of our GDP, equivalent with 125 million people that can be fed, or 47% of Indonesia's population. In the past 20 years, our food loss significantly declined from 61% to 45% in 2019. But our food waste has increased more than 50%. Consumption side become government initiative to tackle. In order to reduce food loss and waste, our country has identified some policy directions including behavior change, improving support system, strengthening regulation, optimizing funding, utilizing food loss and waste, as well as development database. Moreover, the government has tried to prevent food waste by creating platform and cross-sectoral collaborations involving three groups of actors. The first group... Okay, please, we, we're going to have to... Conclude, please. Yes, okay. We have the first group, uh, food providers, and uh, the other group is uh, the organization that become food hubs to connect and manage be be between food providers and recipient groups. And the third group is the recipients. And then managing collaboration to the platform, the government also provides and facilitates food logistic vehicles to distribute surplus food from donors to beneficiaries. For the next, we are ready to collaborate also with IFAT to expand in 38 provinces and 514 districts in the, in the next five years as proposed. I also would like to appreciate FAO because uh, they are facilitating uh, all the issues with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Your Excellency, and apologies for having to interrupt your, your intervention. I, I didn't mean to, mean to be rude, it's just that we have to close in the next five to ten minutes. And having said that, I, I see there, are, uh, there is one hand from the back. Uh, please, if you could just introduce yourself and in one minute say uh, uh, you know, your comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Ratan Lal, Professor of Soil Science, Ohio State. I think this is a very important subject, to have an attitude of produce, 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 throw, 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 waste, waste, waste. It's nothing other than crime against nature. We must stop it. We are using five billion hectares of land under agriculture. We are using 3,150 kilometer cube of water for irrigation. We are using more than 200 million tons of fertilizer with efficiency of hardly 30%. I think if we manage food properly, if we diet properly, we should return half of the land, most of the water back to nature by 2100. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lau. Buongiorno a tutti, sono Marco Lucchini, segretario generale della Fondazione Banco Alimentare Italiana e membro del board della European Food Bank Federation. Parlerò in italiano. No, volevo solo portare un esempio positivo, che è il lavoro che appunto le banche alimentari in tutto il mondo svolgono. Sono in 70 paesi, avendo recuperato più di 3 milioni di tonnellate di cibo donate a centinaia di associazioni che aiutano persone indigenti. In Europa, questo grazie anche alle linee guida che la Commissione ha elaborato insieme agli stakeholder nel 2017. Quindi credo che, seguendo anche la food hierarchy, drink hierarchy, il, il, il prolungare la vita, come veniva prima accennato anche ehm, del prodotto a favore sociale, porta un beneficio sia economico, sia ambientale e appunto sociale. Grazie. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, this, uh, please, yes, please. Ah, thanks so much for the good, uh, very good uh, panel. But I have uh, a general recommendation. Without a strategy of food losses and waste, I think we are not go going to gain anything because uh, the loss is very, very, very costly. We have a study in Sudan about food loss and waste, but not uh, a boost harvest. It is from the start of the cultivation till market. 
about 30% of stable food crops are lost. Uh, we calculated very, very, very simple calculation. We find that if we reserve 50% from this loss, it can feed 4 million people from stable food crops. So a strategy to reduce food loss and waste is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, comment. Um, yes, I believe, yeah, we, we've been informed that we can have some additional time so that we have the opportunity to uh, hear from the floor again and also the reaction of the panel. So uh, we can take uh, one, more, one or two more. Uh, please, yes, please. If you could just introduce yourself and then. Bueno, muchas gracias entonces a, a todos y todas. Gracias al panel por permitir la palabra. Eh, efectivamente, voy a, voy a compartir la experiencia chilena eh, respecto al proyecto de microbancos de alimentos que nace de una coordinación público-privada entre el Ministerio de Desarrollo Social y Familia eh, con su Secretaría Elige Vivir Sano y por otro lado con eh, la Corporación Observatorio del Mercado Alimentario y la Asociación Chilena de Ferias Libres. Eh, que crearon un acuerdo para crear 79 microbancos de alimentos en todas las regiones del país eh, durante este año. Eso implicará que a fin de año estaremos recuperando entre 25 y 30 toneladas de alimentos mensuales en el país. Eh, estos microbancos de alimentos recuperan eh, efectivamente eh, productos en buen estado, frutas y verduras aptas para el consumo humano, eh, para donarlas a organizaciones solidarias, las cuales en su gran mayoría están lideradas por mujeres. Eh, estas, eh, estas organizaciones, por lo tanto, entregan, preparan eh, los alimentos para dárselos a personas en situación de inseguridad alimentaria, que en Chile eh, el, el número ha crecido hasta casi un 20% en la última época. Eh, por lo tanto, para nosotros ha sido fundamental eh, este enfoque porque nos permite colaborar con la protección social con un enfoque en nutrición a través de medidas innovadoras, nos permite también disminuir el desperdicio eh, con todo lo, el impacto ambiental, social y económico que se mencionaba aquí mismo. Eh, y además, por supuesto, como implica una conexión entre los productores, entre las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, permite también generar eh, conexiones sociales que aumentan la sostenibilidad y la resiliencia de nuestras acciones. Esto es marcado en una coordinación entre los distintos sectores del Estado eh, que se ve también, por ejemplo, en la estrategia de soberanía para la seguridad alimentaria que ha sido publicada recientemente en nuestro país. Eh, por lo mismo, eh, sabemos que nuestro trabajo dista de terminar, estamos empezando con muchas de estas medidas eh, y creemos que poner fin a la merma innecesaria de alimentos es un tema de justicia distributiva urgente. Eh, para el bienestar, por supuesto, de nuestras comunidades y del planeta. Muchas gracias. It's a hand, I believe. Um, yes, please. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Mayana Moseli. I'm from Botswana. And I think one of the main things that needs to be done is to find a balance between imports and local production. And what we've done in Botswana is that during certain periods where we have um, a huge abundance of local production in fresh produce, the local market is actually given priority of actually selling the products. And when there's a deficit, that's when the imports are actually allowed to come into the country. But I think the, 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 the message here is to do it in a balanced way so that it doesn't create um, some uh, issues in terms of political stability between us and neighboring countries. And we've seen that actually working well, especially in the horticultural industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe there was another. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Hassan. I am uh, from Sudan and a member of uh, the Scientific uh, Advisory Committee. Um, uh, Massimo um, mentioned in his introduction that most of the food losses take place at the farmer's level. Now in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, we have a serious problem because over 60% of the farmers do not have access to electricity. 
so I'm just trying to see how much of the food loss is, 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 is done simply because these farmers do not have access, small access, it's access to small amount of electricity to enable them to use refrigerators in addition to many other things, small things like schooling and so on. So I don't know whether this has been quantified, but it would be great if we do have that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very pertinent point. Uh, um, I wonder whether there is another hand, but we could, yeah, one last one, and then we'll give a chance to, for the panel to respond. Yes, please. Bonjour, je suis Sylvie Alice du Burkina Faso. Et je suivi avec beaucoup d'attention justement le panel sur les pertes et puis gaspillage. Et je voudrais remercier pour cette thématique très importante. Dans mon pays, le Burkina Faso, pays sahélien, il faut d'abord parler de production suffisante avant de parler de pertes et de gaspillage. C'est quand on en a qu'on gaspille et qu'on perd. Chez moi, au Burkina Faso, le premier facteur limitant, c'est l'eau. Donc, je suis d'accord qu'on trouve quand même des solutions justes pour d'abord conserver et puis apporter l'eau pour pouvoir faire de la production. Donc, des techniques de restauration des eaux du sol, ce n'est pas qu'il ne pleut pas. Au Sahel, peut-être qu'il pleut même plus qu'en Italie ici, mais nous avons des difficultés à mobiliser justement l'eau de la pluie. Et c'est pour moi le moment d'interpeller la communauté internationale à nous accompagner dans l'innovation, les technologies, afin de mobiliser notre eau et produire pour qu'un jour aussi on puisse parler peut-être de perte et de gaspillage. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. And uh, so let's, uh, let's give a chance now for the, uh, the panel to react. And then we will uh, then go. Well, we've had um, up here, I, I am sure you've been wondering, we have uh, Ambassador Stefano Gatti at the end. This event is organized uh, by FAO, the, the government of Italy and the, uh, the Food Systems Hub. And uh, Ambassador Gatti is here present uh, representing the, uh, the Italian uh, government and we want to thank him for his partnership in organizing the event and he will provide uh, closing remarks and so you will have the opportunity to hear from him. Now, uh, having said that, let's now give the opportunity for our distinguished panel to reflect upon some of the issues that have been raised, the experiences from the different countries and also the questions that were posed. And I will, I will start again from my right-hand side and then go to my left-hand side. His Excellency Masuka, over to you. I think let's keep it now for two minutes each and uh, so that we can finish in the next, uh, I believe we have now uh, maybe 20, 20 more minutes. Uh, thank you, moderator. Just like Burkina Faso, Zimbabwe is emerging from food insecurity. And in the past two, three seasons, we've assured uh, the nation of sufficient uh, corn and now sufficient wheat, perhaps one of two countries that are beginning to export in Africa. And we are looking at other value chains as well. So I think it is important to prioritize depending on the country specific circumstances, where now we are saying we need more food on the table. Our, we are not looking so much at the West aspect, although we know it's important. So we are focused on producing enough and reducing losses so that we can get more food to more people when they need it. We know that we need to get to the next stage of looking at the West aspect. But I think the targeting is critical. This morning, we're just reviewing our food systems and transformation strategy and saying that we need to include food loss and waste and aim to reduce this by 50% by 2030, and putting in very specific strategies for the communal area, rural households, the 62% of the population, and then moving on at farm level and at national level, and having very specific targeted interventions by the public sector, and we say, how do you crowd in the uh, private sector? How do you create an enabling policy environment that allows the public, uh, the private sector to see the business of uh, getting into the food 
loss and waste uh, value chain and be able to reduce that with the attendant benefits that arise out of that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Under Secretary. Yeah, so as I hear from the audience and I hear from different experiences and stories and interventions and the work that is being done around the globe, I think I agree. You know, I absolutely think that um, what is happening in the United States and how we approach is very different than how other countries approach. And so it's great to hear just the different approaches and what is working. Um, I want to recognize, because I've heard from, we heard from several members of the audience, um, the nexus between food loss and waste and our utilization of our important resources that we have to grow food. And I think that is a really important nexus that I just wanted to uplift and highlight as well. Um, and then I, I just also want to recognize, um, of course, we're working on how we redirect food uh, that is going to go to loss um, to important feeding networks and important feeding um, channels, uh, but the role that women can play, and I, so it's really great to hear about the role that women can play in, um, in really um, addressing so that we're feeding our population the great healthy food that we're producing uh, before it gets lost or wasted. Uh, so I just wanted to uplift those and just, um, it's great to hear from everyone and to hear about the work that's being done around the globe and how different our approaches are, and sometimes also how we can learn from each other and how our common approaches can be applied to, to others as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Under Secretary. Ms. Siti, over to you. Thank you very much. This was very, very uh, exciting, uh, hearing interventions from, from the floor. Uh, I, I absolutely agree, food loss and waste needs to be part of the climate strategy of a nation, it needs to be part of the food strategy of a nation, and it is a moral imperative to, to reduce it in our different countries. It is also adaptation and a mitigation agenda, and we heard that about water. Uh, it's absolutely right. And absolutely there's import substitution. Let me very quickly give you an example of Rwanda. Rwanda at the moment imports 80% of its tomato consumption, but it grows enough. And we did some uh, simulation where if Rwanda cuts uh, domestic losses by 20% in tomato, their imports of it, it's, it's, it's uh, foreign exchange that it saves is not trivial. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the other part is the rest of the, just with one action of a small country, the rest of the world has more food without more um, higher emissions. So it's a win-win on both sides. But, but it was very interesting and exciting. Thanks. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very pertinent. And uh, so we will go now to the left-hand side and just go Syria Lee with, from Dr. Dashti and then all the way to uh, Ms. Uh, Bori. Thank Over you. to you. Th thank you, Diva. I, I think, as we heard, there's a very big issue on the food waste. And studies show is that it's almost two-thirds of the food production is goes that is on, on the food waste, which is consumed between food loss and waste. And I think maybe it's about time governments looks into food waste taxation. I mean, uh, let's tax people who are wasting their food. You're not getting more money from the people, but you're conserving from them their budgets. Because now they will have more budgets and planning it. So it's conservation through the taxation uh, issue. And I think there's very important issues was talked about the imports of, of food. And I think now we need to revisit also the food aid issues. Because certain times what's happening is these food aids are coming and changing the eating habits of the, of the locals, which is not supposed to be intended like this. If it's an emergency, it should be partial, but it shouldn't be changing the habits. And we need to improve on the production of the local uh, 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 food items that is locally produced on that. So the impulse also is because a lot of countries had changed their habits because of the food aid and then became dependent on importing of stable foods. And this is, needs to be revisited again. And I do agree, and all of us uh, said the same thing, is that partnership. There's various multi-stakeholders that needs to be part of the decision-making, that needs to be part of the solution uh, issues, and we need to engage them as, as, as we move uh, along. And finally, the innovative approaches. It's very important, the innovative approaches and learning from each other as we move along to address this very important issue. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And over to you. Thank you very much, Divine, and thank you indeed to, for, for all those who've spoken from the floor as well. I think I'd like to go back to what the Minister uh, and Jennifer said as well about the, the local context and how important that is. And that's what we put into our EU approach, uh, that we have overarching goals, but then the member states have to look at their own strategies. Uh, but if I home in on this question of our hotspot, which is very much what's happening at the consumer and, and the citizens level, and where we want to set uh, this binding 30% target, obviously the reasons why it happened vary uh, quite significantly. It's about how the shopping gets planned, how the food is stored, um, and how we prepare and eat it. Um, and I think others on the panel as well were talking about the fact that we need to look at that in innovative ways as well to try and uh, adapt the systems. Um, but it depends a lot on consumers' motivation, their awareness, their opportunity, and their ability. So the ones who know best actually what's happening um, are the citizens. So that's why from an EU point of view, we've actually reached out to citizens. Um, and over the last six months, had an intensive dialogue with them about what they, they think is happening. Um, and how we can help them to change things. So that will be very much integrated uh, into what we do and our policies and the way that our member states work uh, going forward. So I think local context is important, but let's also bring in uh, the consumers and the citizens to tell us what's happening really at their end so that we really um, can, can factor that into our approaches because quite often uh, we actually get the wrong impression from behavioral studies in terms of what's going on. So I think we need to go directly to the citizens to hear from them too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General Bori. Okay, so we've, we've had the, the reflection of the panel, but let's also uh, give the opportunity, Mr. Maximo Torero, I would, you, you now are just also putting your hat as one of those that listened to the, the panel and also the, the feedback from the, the audience. If you have some, some remarks. We would Very briefly, it. and thank you so much, Divine. Uh, so there was a specific question uh, from the scientific group. Uh, so look, what we need to understand is when we measure losses, we need to measure the quantity and the quality of the loss. And that requires a lot of specificities that normally we didn't look at. So if I am looking at potatoes, the standards and the attributes of potatoes in Peru will be different to the standards and attributes of potatoes in India. If I look at high value commodities, the standards will be different because every country, and depending on the variety and the reality, needs to have their own standards. And the first element was to figure out how we can measure this, taking into account those attributes and specificities of the commodities. And then the second point was to how you distribute the analysis across the value chain, because you need to have different sampling structures. Uh, and once we do that, we are able to identify the reasons. And that's what your specific question. And the major reasons we are finding in the pre post harvest and during the harvest and the post harvest are mostly linked to pest diseases climate issues, excess of rain, lack of rain, weather, which brings up the concept of science in terms of more resistant varieties, uh, and also how we can resolve and resistant to pests and diseases. We're also finding problems of human capacity, uh, capabilities in terms of harvesting. A lot of losses are because they are not trained to harvest properly uh, what they produce. And when they use certain machinery, for example, they break the grain and so on and so forth. Now, your question was related to energy. And most of the elements that were reported are also on transportation side, but it's not directly linked to energy, a certain type of energy, of course. But I think it's what you were asking is more related to how I can conserve and extend the shelf of the life of the, of the product. Farmers don't think of that yet because that's more on the trading side, no? how, how I can trade the product and extend the shelf of the life of the product. So, and therefore, they are not reporting that as one of the major potential concerns. But we know that in the storage side, in the post-harvest side, uh, storage and, and cooling facilities for high-value commodities is essential to extend the shelf life. The problem is how you do it when you are off-grid and not on-grid, because you have to have certain different ways of doing it. You can do solar, of course, but solar is not enough when you have to do it for a period of time, and you need a lot of technology in terms of what type of temperature you need to use to be able to conserve that. And that's what we are working in terms of mobile storage facilities that will clack or, or plug into a hub storage facility where we have on grid. So how we locate those storage facilities will be important. But again, right now for the farmer side, that's not in their minds. They're more concerned of what they put into the intermediary and into the processor. In the side of the wayside, that's very problematic. And because it is basically how household, peri-urban and, and uh, intermediate households that don't necessarily have good quality electricity, 
and good quality energy, how they store their food, and that could also create, create damages. So again, it's, it's very specific to the commodity and to the country. And I finish on the last one. I think people mention a lot about water, and that's essential. There are countries and regions of the world where water is essential. And allowing for food to be lost and, and lost that little water is, is problematic, and that's something that we need to, to find ways to, to minimize that. But also we need to try to bring this into the true cost accounting, that we had another session on true cost accounting, because when you trade food, you trade water too. And if the country is not charging for that water, that is not being presented in the price of the commodity you are trading. And the final point is the incentives. And I think Gita raised this, which is really important. Incentives are a problem because I can do as a farmer all my effort to have grain which is clean, aflatoxin free, or have a commodity which is perfect in quality and standards. But if the market doesn't recognize that the standard, then I don't have any incentive to continue to do it. So we have to look at that part and the legislation part and how we can standardize and put attributes in the pricing schemes so that works, and, and that incentive and that effort that the farmers does is recognizing the market. If not, what will be the incentive for them to use the scar scarce resources if they don't have an incentive when they bring a good product, a good quality product into the market, it will be lost. So, so it's very important to, to work on all those dimensions uh, across. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Torero, Chief Economist of FAO. I think now we've, uh, we've come to the end of the, the panel discussion, but before we go to the uh, official closing from uh, uh, Ambassador Stefano Gatti, uh, we just have one short item, and if I could please ask the uh, production crew to put the last uh, presentation up. It's just a two-slide presentation. Is it, is it coming? <laughs> so essen essentially what um, the presentation about is about is what you have now on the screen, which is the uh, one, two, three pledge. So this is a pledge that was uh, sponsored by the, the Food is Never Waste Coalition now, as you would remember, following the, the Food System Summit 2021, the um, uh, coalitions were formed. And there was a coalition formed on this very issue that we are discussing today, food loss and waste. And the name of the coalition is the Food is Never Waste Coalition. And the coalition did sponsor during COP27, driven by the recognition that food loss and waste is a key driver of greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions, and so it contributes to uh, climate change, and so provides a, 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 an interesting opportunity, a very viable opportunity in most cases to address the climate issue that we are facing. So the coalition launched this pledge during uh, COP27 in Sham El Sheikh, Egypt, and the pledge is simply to call on all of us stakeholders to make firm commitments to reduce food loss and waste. So it's not wishful uh, thinking, but say exactly what we want to do. And this I am calling on all of us here present the, uh, from the private sector, from civil society, from the member countries, make this commitment. The reason why it is important to make this commitment is that then we can all share what we are doing. We can all see what uh, the commitments people have, have made, especially with regard to the climate issue. So the, the links are there. You can go, just feel it's very simple. If you want to reduce, I heard here from the panel, certain targets for certain countries and regions, just say it, put it in the pledge. And then we, 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 we put all these pledges together and then we go to COP28 and we can then proclaim what we are doing. The second thing I want to say is to invite all of you to be part of this coalition. Okay, the coalition, I think the issue of partnership 
and exchanging ideas was mentioned here a number of times. And the only way that can happen is if we use the platforms that we have. We have this platform. It was meant to then bring all of us together. And so my invitation would be that we all, as we go home tonight or tomorrow, let's work together and let's keep this coalition alive. And with that, I would like to uh, again um, uh, thank uh, Ambassador uh, Stefano Gatti for the, uh, the role of the, the government of Italy in, in uh, convening uh, this event. And I would like now to pass over the floor to him for his uh, remarks before we close. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. I see that there's a very well structured organization. So we have the, the phone of the moderator and the lady that gives you five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, two minutes. So I try to keep the level of anxiety low. So thank you very much uh, to everybody. And uh, um, I think that if we can take some uh, results from this uh, uh, conversation that was really extremely important, uh, thank you very much to Maximo for having conceived uh, the session uh, and having worked with Italy. Italy is absolutely committed to the centrality of the issue of uh, food loss. I would say that what uh, I take away from the session is first of all that we have one very simple problem and uh, incredibly complex solution to this problem. The, the problem is very simple. I mean, food loss and food waste is food that is produced and not eaten. So you don't need a complex definition of the problem. The complexity comes, uh, what has been uh, appeared clear uh, from the session, from the solution. I mean, uh, there's no simple solution. There is a, there is a, a series of actions and different parts of our economic system and different actions from a, a variety of actors that need to be implemented in order to find a solution to this. Um, one thing that uh, um, I was wondering, uh, I, I would probably would have liked more uh, in the debate to come out, so I will want to add it, is that of the many you know, consequences of food loss and food waste, one uh, is coming out even more importantly today, is the environmental impact of food loss and food waste. We are speaking more and more, we're going towards the COP28, where food and climate are more and more the issue, they are closely connected, and none more so than food loss and food waste, because all this food that you have produced, uh, you have had emissions to produce it, and you have wasted, so these emissions were useless. And, and that is, you know, is quite big uh, as an issue to consider. Now, the complexity comes from the fact that there are so many drivers that, you know, take us to the results that you have seen. Uh, they, they come from the production levels. Uh, there are economic drivers, you know, consumer behaviors, production techniques, uh, social economic issues, really uh, so many. And surely it's not up to me to um, resume all, all, all these points that have very well come out uh, today during the session. Uh, it has also come out uh, that uh, reducing food loss and food waste in a consistent and integrated manner uh, throughout all the supply chain is crucial to act on so many levels. Uh, so we have uh, a, the individual level, so that is something that has come out also in the slides that Maximo has illustrated to us. Uh, this is a question of advocacy, and we need to convince public opinion, young people, of how this is important and relevant. I would like here quickly to highlight the experience of Italy. We have Waste Watcher Observatory in Italy since several years that have had an impact. We have instituted a day of food loss and food waste, and this has gained a lot of traction. It's on the newspapers, on the televisions, the day in which this happens. And really, you have influential people that uh, most, you know, it's a cause. It's like you have to rally a cause around and uh, convince people that a part, an important part of the, uh, uh, the waste part happens in, uh, in the household. For Italy, the division between food loss and food waste is 30% uh, 30, 30 of the overall food loss and food waste is in the uh, production chain, 70% is, uh, you know, arriving on the table or at the end part in which we eat it. So it's quite significant, it's clear for us where we have to have our efforts. For other countries, it could be different, it could even be the reverse. So there are different solutions for different countries. Let me just say that uh, uh, what 
comes out from the session very clearly is this. We have had three days of uh, very important uh, discussions with very high level attendance, and obviously as government of Italy, we're extremely happy and satisfied. Uh, this occasion was called by the Secretary General to look at things that are done around the world that make a difference and things that we are not doing well enough. I think that we can clearly say that food loss and food waste is one of the central issues we have to carry forward. We have to carry it forward to COP28. We will definitely, as Italy, carry it forward uh, to, towards our next presidency of the G7 in 2024. Uh, we are engaged and we commit to work with FAO that has a very important leading role in this. Uh, very important, as the chair has said, uh, the coalition. Italy is part of this coalition and we encourage everybody to, to work uh, in this coalition. And uh, I think that in the report of the Secretary General, we will propose clearly that uh, of the issues in we, that we need to make progress together much more in the next few months and years, food loss and food waste is clearly one of them. It should be kept high on the international agenda to unlock the potential of food and to be a major solution for the people and the planet. Thank you very much. With that, I think uh, I just want to thank you again for your presence here and well, just declare the, the session closed. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.